And that's just, you know, Uber doesn't have, well, they do have, you know, a large business. Um, they, they can't assign the cost that way and they don't have a good path to, to getting those operational costs down and the unit economics right over time. Um, and that obviously puts Tesla at a huge advantage. Just going back to the point that you mentioned on like the product reveal, it, it definitely seems like Tesla, it's, it's learning from the past. You know, you had the Roadster that's still yet to be delivered. And then also the, the Cybertruck that um, came a couple of years after it was announced. And now we have a new product launching at the beginning of, of next year and very li- little detail on it. And it looks like it's going to kind of hit the ground running. Um, so it definitely seems like maybe they're learning from past product announcements with the forthcoming uh, low cost vehicle. And I know we've spoken internally about it. There seems to be a lot of confusion between differentiating the cyber cab and, and the, the next uh, gen low cost vehicle. But um, in my opinion, it seems like it'll be like a low cost kind of stripped down Model 3, Model Y with the steering wheel and um, ultimately probably support their vehicle growth that Elon said on the call of the 20 to 30 percent. Yeah. Uh, Hans, this is probably a good place for you to jump in, but because uh, I know this is like a freaking we had Sandy on last week too talking about this It's like we've been trying yeah. to figure this out. It's so hard. Well, I'm definitely in alignment with Daniel on this. I think that that it'll be something that's halfway in between the cyber cab and the model three and the model y most likely and at least one you know there's there's so much ambiguity in the specific statement in so many different ways that it can be interpreted but i think that makes the absolute most sense to me especially when you think about the the supply chain constraints like how do you ramp from two million vehicles a year in 2023 to at least um having a million cyber cab capacity run rate at the end of 2026 and potentially more out of just one factory like you've got to do something to get that supply chain kind of built up between here and there and uh you know if we or sorry yeah two million in 2024 and then so 2025 we'll have probably exiting with close to a a three million units a year run rate uh with whatever these vehicles are and you know that's quite a bit of uh growth over 2024 and um and then adding you know at least another million in 2026 so we're talking about having capacity at the end of 2026 it's essentially double the capacity that we have installed today and you know that's just huge and if you're going to do that you've got to progress smoothly in stages you've got to utilize all of your existing infrastructure wisely um and so that that absolutely makes the most sense to me. I think the one thing that I'm reminded of in all of this is that we we kind of knew that they had this system in place for this ride share, you know, internally for employees, but they were just so good at being quiet. Like they, there was one little piece of information that they gave to us um, in one of the quarterly earnings reports. And then I remember, in fact, I think Tasha, it was on one of the the conversations that we had that we looked at. There was a, an employee, Rosalie Nathans, I think, uh, who posted on LinkedIn about being the person who was featured in that little clip and saying that she had to pinch herself, that she got to, you know, be part of that and that they're, you know, this is a real uh, network that they're using. But when you combine that, with the fact that, you know, they have to do all sorts, like we know that Tesla has in-house drivers that are doing validation of the latest builds of FSD. And so they're, you know, they are driving and they're paying these drivers anyways. So why not, if you're having drivers driving around, well, they should be giving employees rides. Like that's obviously the most efficient use of resources and capital and Tesla's all about efficiency. And so like all of the common sense things were there. All like we we knew that they had the app ready to go a while back. We knew that all the pieces were in place. Um, but yeah, just because they had been so hush hush about it, we mm-hmm. even though we knew it was there, like it's like, okay, well, I don't know, maybe it's not, you know, then the all the the doubt creeps back in or just forgetting about it because, you know, we're inundated with all the new data that's coming in all the time. And yeah, I'd had forgotten about those pieces of information for the last few months and then reminded, yep, those were, you know, those were signal in all the noise and, and they've been just steadily plugging away at this for quite some time. 
I think too when they first came out everyone was speculating they were just renders but it seems now in hindsight they're actual right. app screenshots which is a testament to how long they've been testing it and yeah I think as well on the the like you mentioned utilizing the existing infrastructure that seems to be a huge play for this compact car because the confusion stems around the cyber cab they used the term next gen platform which was going to originally use the unbox method and then to your point I think Elon came in at the beginning of the year and said, okay, we need to look at what's our existing capacity to produce cars. And it seems like that's what the, the compact car is going to be. It's going to be using the existing lines in their uh, gigafactories and maybe not achieving as much, many cost savings as they originally planned because it's not going to use the unbox method, but um, definitely maximizing their resources before building out the subsequent gigafactories for the ultimate uh, ramp up of the cyber cab. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and for Ride Hill, you know, we've um, uh, published research on this before that it's like, well, even if they launch with safety drivers, um, essentially a human driven Ride Hill service, because electric vehicles already have a third of the maintenance and operating costs of a gas powered car, you know, compared to the average Ride Hill car on the road, like technically they actually could undercut prices a bit if they wanted to. Um, so they're already like a, re a very real competitor to Uber, especially given, um, you know, that they have the scale to put um, cars on the road coming out of inventory, you know, potentially customers signing their cars up. Um, so I, I, I think that that's, uh, you know, it's like today they compete or when they launch, they compete with Uber. And then long term, when they take the driver out, it's like, well, Uber's not really competition anymore because the market expands so much when you lower the price. Um, and I, I think, yeah, to this like existing infrastructure, like footprint, um, from a manufacturing perspective, um, charging, even though it looks like, you know, they'll do some wireless charging, maybe build out a specific ride hill infrastructure in the future. Like at first when they launch, um, they could likely just kind of use what they have and, and make do. And I think yeah. one of the things to think about is the fact that Tesla can account for the cost of a lot of the, you know, whether they want to account for the cost of the safety drivers, um, but as part of their FSD build out, because it all is data validation and it is kind of a transitory investment that, hey, we're, you know, as we're scaling the system up, you know, yes, we have this entire business that can help support that cost for now. And this is an investment in reducing the overall, um, you know, operating cost of this platform and the, the robo taxis overall. And that's just, you know, Uber doesn't have, well, they do have, you know, a large business, um, they they can't assign the cost that way, and they don't have a good path to to getting those operational costs down and the unit economics right over time, um, and that obviously puts Tesla at a huge advantage, and um, and I think one of the reasons that we have seen part of this shift in strategy from Elon in the the build out of capacity for vehicles is because I don't think he necessarily expected to have to make the sizes of investments that they have made in their training compute um, that building out Cortex in Austin is, you know, not a cheap endeavor. And I, I think that they prioritized the, all of the, you know, infrastructure around getting the brain for both FSD and the bot ahead of building out capacity to then, give those brains the physical embodiment that they needed. Um, and because, you know, if we go back in time a little bit, their focus was on trying to get Dojo to the point where it could be that brain and it hasn't progressed quickly enough to do that, which meant that they had to go the third party vendor route, which is much more expensive than if they had been able to, you know, do all of that training with in-house Dojo compute, which would have been a lot more, you know, it's, it's more infrastructure, but it's also more energy the, the NVIDIA chips are not going to be as efficient at doing that video training as if as Dojo would have been if it had been capable of doing what it was that they wanted to do. And so all of that just meant that there was money that they didn't really intend to spend on CapEx um, outside, or they intended to spend it on capacity and physical infrastructure for building out vehicles and robots. Um, but they had to kind of switch some things around in the overall timing and um, and make, yeah, a little bit more investment and things that they they thought were going to go hopefully a different direction. Yeah, something interesting that Kathy and I learned at the 1010 event too is that you don't build out training capacity unless you can like immediately use it. You know, they were talking about how they shared um, some chips 
uh, with with X AI. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they mentioned on the call in the um, in the investor letter that they that um, the capacity that they at least plan to get up and running happen like sooner than expected. Um, and of course, they have more planned. Um, so I, I think, you know, could, could be reading into it too much, but, it, um, one, one way to look at that is like, they are, they are so ready to receive it that they're actually making an effort to speed it up, m meaning that they're like confident in the software progress that they're seeing for FSD in terms of like, you know, the path to going unsupervised. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Yeah. And one, one point that I'd love to make on Uber, cause I feel like this is so heavily debated. And so, you know, I hear comments from Uber execs all the time about kind of their thoughts on the autonomous space. I think they're really disadvantaged here because you have to partner with a technology player. The technology player in terms of autonomy is the company that's actually able to bring the cost down. So it's like longer term, who do you think holds kind of like the cards and kind of the power and their relationship? If Uber is really just supplying the platform and Uber today, it's like their assets are really their drivers and that's going away. Um, and even I was thinking about this, like even from, um, like a network optimization perspective, first of all, like, I don't think it's trivial to launch a ride help platform and do routing appropriately and like, please your customers. I don't think that's trivial. I just think it's an easier problem to solve than solving for full autonomy. And, and actually in an autonomous platform and, and what Tesla plans to do, like you have so much more control over your fleet because it's not people. I mean, sure. You have customers supplementing demand with their own vehicles, but you decide how many cars you want in a city. It's not like based on driver signups, right? So I, I do think there's actually like even more optimization that they can kind of squeeze out of ride hill that we're just not seeing today. Yeah, I know. go ahead, Daniel. Oh, on the routing optimization too, I mean, they do it today with superchargers. When you click to go to a supercharger, you can see how many vehicles are on the way, how many there'll be when they're there. Um, so there's definitely capabilities they can leverage Tesla that they use today. Yeah, I've, I've long been on the train that Uber's dead. I just like I, I just don't understand the value proposition. And like let's let's role play this, right? Let's say Uber does become a place where you can offer uh self-driving vehicles, let's say, right? It's gonna be on the same network as the as the places where people have cars, like driver, drive people drivable vehicles, right? Whatever we want to call them, manual vehicles, okay? So what does what's what is that gonna do? That's gonna artificially inflate the price of the self-driving vehicle to match the market demand for whatever that is, right? So like you're introducing lower cost pieces into this network and yet and, but you're still going to uh, sell it at whatever the market is demanding. And so if there's not another player out there that's doing a purely self-driving, you're still gonna be okay. You're just gonna increase your profit margin, right? But as soon as you introduce a player that has the whole stack, you know, it has the manufacturing, it has the app, it has the self-driving technology, and it, it just requires Tesla saying, we are going to go to market with this. Automatically, they're going to be the, the cheaper product. Automatically. And they're going to have the same profit margins, if not better than Uber. So at that point, why would anybody choose Uber over Tesla? It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. And not only that, Tesla, to, to, you know, to, the, to the point of the, of the conversation, they have all the data. They can gather all the data from those learnings. Like Uber is not really going to have access to that proprietary data. Tesla is going to have access to that proprietary data. Data, and so, like, why would Tesla go through the pain of creating a, a ride hailing app and testing the ride hailing service if they're not trying to go to market with a ride hailing service? Right? It's like it to me. It doesn't Uber in this world. Like the only way they make sense is if they just turn into a fleet provider. Like literally, they're they're just they just buy Tesla cars. And then they put it on Tesla's network <laughs> and then they just manage the fleet, you know? Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, they just announced that because um, that's not really their business model now, owning and maintaining the cars. But they said that they're going to do that with Waymo. So it's like, oh, are you considering that transition? And yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I, I think the fact that Waymo need, feels like they need to partner with them. And, you know, let's like argue on the other end, like maybe it's a Trojan horse. Maybe they're just kind of learning about the network and then they're going to say, yeah, no, thanks. Um, we're going to keep our own platform here. But I think the fact that they're doing it kind of is like, uh, you know, showing that they they're the scale that they have is hard to actually please customers in the cities that they're operating in. So they need that support from Uber. Um, so no, I know I totally agree about Uber's future, but I, I think that. That's not like the typical, I, I, I see 
all the time. Um, I even, you know, you saw after the event, like Uber, Uber stock went up. Um, so I, I, I don't think that that's like the popular opinion. Um, so I, I think like the only way that Uber does well in this scenario is like, which I, you know, I don't think this will happen, but if Tesla totally fails and there's like no scaled player, and then you're stuck with, you know, Waymo or let's say like other Waymo like companies that just don't have the scale and need Uber in the short term. But even then longer term, I feel like, again, who who gets the majority of the economics when the when a, the autonomous tech is actually lowering that price? 